Welcome everyone this morning to worship time here at Sanford Church of Christ. I'd like to welcome all our Facebook watchers as well as the radio and we'd like to invite you to come and be with us in person sometime if you could. But uh, in the way, of, oh, also our visitors, if we have any, we'd like to also welcome you and let you know that you're our guest. And if you could stay around, we might get to know you a little better afterwards. We'd appreciate it. And if you could fill out a visitor card and give it to one of the men in the back, we'd appreciate that as well. Uh, we have some prayer things. We continue to remember the Ukraine, the brothers and sisters in Ukraine, as well as Russia, around the world, all this stuff that's going on. Uh, Jackie and Sandra, as she has some more procedures that will be coming in the near future, so remember her and Jackie as they go through this, as well as their son, Jonathan, that's still in the cure facility. Uh, remember me and Connie, she went to the doctor Thursday, and Sherry took me to Duke. Monday night, I think, I was eating an apple, and I was talking to Connie, and I took a breath, and the apple went down in my lung. So I quit breathing. <laughs> and thankfully, Connie stayed calm enough to beat me in the back till it come up. It didn't come up, but I got to breathing again. I finally got, it came out. They was going to do a bronc and take it out. And I told Sherry, I said, I think I can get it up, and I am still sore from coughing that apple up. <laughs> but we got it out. Thank the Lord for that. Uh, but we have some wonderful doctors and nur care nurses. But uh, I was waiting to be transferred from Duke Central to the big Duke Hospital for the Bronx, and it, it came in the process of that, so I didn't have to have that done. Also, continue to remember the people like Billy Boss that would love to be here that are not here with us for the reasons of health and distance. So remember him. Uh, Ralph and Sue continue to remember them, and Sue's sister, Melinda, has cancer. Uh, Brian is going to a lectureship at Freed Hartman the first week of February. Keep that in your prayers as well as he travels over there. Uh, preacher at Hamilton has stage four lung cancer. Doesn't have his name. Yeah, it does. Wesley Williams. So remember him as well. And can. Uh, as well as my friend Ronnie Clark, I've had on here for as long. He has stage four liver and lung, uh, not lung, liver and, uh, yeah, I forgot. I forgot. Colon cancer, I'm sorry. And I talked to him yesterday, and he's had his first chemo treatment. He starts again this week, so he said it didn't make him as sick as he thought, but continue to remember him and his family, if you will. Uh, also, Jody's in Belize. Pray for him as he's down there. I know he's struggling to miss this cold weather, but... Uh, remember him as he's down sharing the gospel with these men and women in Belize so uh, also Miss Barbara McGuire that passed away remember her family and Mr. Larry Young that Sherry had been taking care of over the past few years uh, doing his shopping and his banking and different things he passed away last Friday we was out at his house and he passed and his son was in the military and he came home he stationed in Florida somewhere and he's struggling trying to get everything put together so remember that family if you would uh, also yesterday in the men's meeting we decided that February the 5th which is the first Sunday before we go down for our lunch Cy si will present our annual budget that we've uh, decided on or have whatever you want to say anyway we've got an annual budget in place and he will present that to the congregation between uh, worship time and our lunch time downstairs on february 5th and brian gave me this as mark your calendars for march 17th through 19th 2023 sore youth rally what is truth and it's in uh, i don't know who's going it's in augusta georgia and i will put this on the board if anyone's interested in going to augusta georgia uh also, March 19th is my 20th anniversary of my lung transplant, so I'll be here. <laughs> That's on a Sunday. So, with that, uh, would you pray with me? Our God and our Father, we come to you once again to thank you for this day. Thank you for this time you give us, Father, that we can come together as a family of Christians. And, Father, we pray as we do this, we do it in accordance with the way you would have us to present your word and the message. And, Father, we also lift the prayer list, the many that is on it. You know what their needs are better than they themselves do. We pray for them and their families, Father, but you are the great physician. It's your will be done in each one of their lives, and we pray, Father, that if they're not part of your family, that they would turn to you before it's too late. We just lift each one of them to you. Father, we lift our Ukraine family to you. We lift the people in Russia that are struggling through this as well. And 
Father, we just pray for all the men and women that are out here every day, the military, policemen, EMS, firemen that are risking their lives daily for people they may never know and may never meet again, but they are willing to put their lives on the line for us. And we pray, Father, that they may have a safe day that they can return home to their loved ones as well. Now we pray you be with us through the remainder of our time together here this day. In Christ's name, amen. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise His name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all His angels praise proclaim. All His hosts together praise Him, so
853. 853 will be our song after the lesson. 853. Before the Lord's Supper, let's sing number 603. 603. 603. Gary, thanks for the announcements. Van, thanks for the songs. We've had the privilege of singing. We'll look forward to later in the service for that privilege again. At this point, we want to emphasize the Lord's Supper. That's a privilege, isn't it? And then we'll emphasize our giving. That's also a privilege, isn't it? If you have your Bible, let's turn to the book of Titus. For some reason, this passage really gripped me. So we'll begin the reading in Titus chapter 3 beginning at verse 3 through verse 8. And I'll be using the New King James Version. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. That's quite a description, is it? Before Christ and after Christ. Now, as we continue the reading, notice what's said about God, the Father, and God the Son, and God the Spirit. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly 
through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Somehow that reading really gripped me, and I hope it will grip you as well. I believe we're ready now for the bread, the fruit of the vine. And in light of our songs, why are we going to observe the bread, the fruit of the vine? Because we love the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To me, the Lord's Supper basically says, this is how much heaven loves you. God loves you. Jesus loves you. Spirit loves you. You hope I love you. No question about heaven, but there could be a question about you and me. We're not only to love heaven, but one another. So let's have a prayer for the loaf and I'm going to assume all of you have. But let's have a prayer first for the bread, the loaf. Father, again, we're just so thankful for your grace. Jesus, again, we're just so thankful for what you did at Calvary. In spirit, we're just so thankful that you've given us the inspired word that outlines even the Lord's Supper in our giving. We trust, Father, that what we do this morning and every first day of the week this year will help us to really think about and restore what Jesus said, do this in memory of me. Thanks again now for the bread and this weekly reminder of what grace and love has done for us. Again, this is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's have a prayer now for the fruit of the vine. Father, again, we're just so thankful for your mercy. And we trust that we'll think about what Jesus did at Calvary. And he shed his blood for you and me. Again, we're just so moved and thankful for this weekly observance. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We want to have a prayer for the offering. And I like to look at it. Lord's Supper reminds us again of the love of God. And our giving really is saying, Well, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this is how much I love you. And so there is a box in the foyer. 
And as you leave, you want to put something in it, we'll thank you for doing that. Recently I read, I just take it for granted. We have clean water. We have heat. Now we'll add, we have air conditioning too. We're really blessed. All my life, I've taken it for granted. You just turn on the faucet and there's clean water. All my life, even when it was cold, we had heat. Now, we have air conditioning too. We're really blessed, aren't we? Some people in our world would even say we're, well, we're rich. We might deny that, but really compared to a lot of people in this world, we are rich. So, it's really appropriate to give thanks for how well off we are and our giving. So, will you bow with me? Father, we realize you gave your son. Your son gave his life. And the Spirit reveals your kindness. Father, we trust we'll realize how well off we are in this country. And in the minds of many, we really are rich. We pray, Father, that everything we do this year will bring glory to your name, advance the cause of Jesus, and increase appreciation for the Spirit-given Word. And Father, Bless our offering. And we pray that many precious souls will be in heaven because of what we give each week. Thank you for all of your gifts and blessings. And thank for the generosity of your people here in Sanford. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Good morning. Good to see you. It is really good to see you. Uh, I know it's a little wet outside, so it's always interesting to know uh, who's going to 
be able to get out uh, for that Sunday. I'm glad to see you here and, and attentive and, and taking part uh, in this worship. This morning, I want to spend just a few minutes, and we'll begin there in Acts chapter 1. If you want to go ahead and make your way there, if you haven't already, we're going to look at that in just a minute. Uh, Lisa and I were, were reflecting on something this week, and I was talking about how it just seems like, uh, I know this is an old cliche, but the older I get, the quicker things just happen. Uh, Week to week, it seems to, see, I'm not getting that to change. Sai, I may have to get you to move that forward for me. There we go. Um, but it seems like, you know, time just gets faster, and it's like one Sunday to the next. It's like, uh, it's Saturday night, uh, you know, you're trying to get ready, get your mind, heart ready for Sunday morning. Sunday comes along, and Sunday's busy, and then it's like, we're right back at Saturday night, and it's just like the weeks just cascade over one another, you know, um, week to week, and, and it's just amazing, and and, you know, we're given these little time markers called children. And you watch those children grow up, and you see how fast they grow up. And, uh, and, and Facebook does something to me that just tears me up. They show you those memories. You might, uh, you might appreciate this picture or something. I don't know whatever it says up there. But it shows you pictures from year, years ago. And, and it shows you your children when they were little bitty and... and uh, you know, life was so different then, and you look at them now, and they're so big, and they're growing up, and and uh, they're becoming little people, right? And that's kind of a time a time marker for us, isn't it? And it lets us know how quickly time does pass before our eyes. You know, time is one of those commodities, um, maybe one of our, our most valuable commodities. Uh, you know, gold and silver. Those only have value as we assess them to have value. There's no inherent value in in any any of those financial tools that we utilize for trade and merchandise. Uh, Think about all the other things that we hold valuable. Time is is one of those very few entities that that God's not making any more of. You know, we, we all set out on a journey when we were born... And there's a time period that we have an opportunity that we have that quickly vanishes away. You know, James maybe says it best. He, he's talking about boasting about what you're going to do tomorrow and boasting about all the big plans you're going to make and you're going to do this, you can go here and trade and sell. He says, but he says, that's arrogance. Don't you know your life is like, is like the vapor that... That, that's above that boiling water that, that, that's just here for a short time and then vanishes away. You know, when, when those uh, water molecules begin to break down and, and either they fall back into the water or they, you know, or they evaporate off into gas, right? We don't see that. It just seems to disappear. And there's some element of truth about that in regard to time. The time we have with our spouse, it's fleeting. We have so many years, right, to do things. The time we have with our children is important because God's not going to give us but so much. The time we have with our church family. Think about the members here that we have, we've seen pass on into their eternity. We don't get those back. As much as we'd love to, time, time just continues to tick on. And that's why Paul says we need to make the best use of our time. You know, I think about Acts chapter 1 in this mindset. Now, if you go to Acts chapter 1, Luke is picking up kind of right where he left off in his gospel account. And, and, and you, you get a feel of the context there. If you think about what's going on, Jesus is, is getting ready to depart. Those, those first 11 verses 
is, is his final interaction with his apostles and other disciples. And so they're all standing around, and, and I wonder if they're reflecting and trying to appreciate the time they've had. They've already seen him leave one time in death, and he came back, but that's short-lived, isn't it? It's, it's about 50 days, and that's it. And, and this time when he leaves, he's going to be gone for a while. They don't know how long, but they know that there's a more permanence to this. You know, when, when we get up in the morning and, and we go to work and, we go to, and our children go to school or, or you go to school and, and we go about our lives, we, we rest with the assurance, although it's not that assured, but we rest in the hope of assurance that in the afternoon, evening time, they're going to come back. And we'll be rekindled together there in the home and, and we'll go through our nightly rituals and we'll get up and we'll do it again the next day. And, and each day we, we do that. And, and that repetition of time can almost get us into this kind of lull us into sleep of not appreciating the few moments we have with those we love instead of a really appreciating them. But I bet you in Acts chapter 1, because of what they've already been through, the apostles are not struggling to appreciate the moment. And they're probably also a little bit confused and, and shocked at, at, at the events that have happened because there's been some pretty, I mean, just crazy things that have happened recently, things they've been a part of. And they're standing there and they're having this interaction with this man that they have devoted themselves to, that they love dearly. He is their Lord, he is their master, he is their rabbi. And so, I want to get into the text there in verse 6. He's, they ask the question, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of heaven? Now, what, what we know immediately from their question is that they don't understand quite yet the nature of the kingdom of God and of what God is trying to work out. They also probably don't appreciate completely what's about to happen, both to Jesus and to themselves. But I think they ask a very human question. You know, God, what are you going to do next? How are you going to work in this moment? How, how are you going to restore the kingdom? And they're asking about time, aren't they? What's Jesus' response? And I think this is interesting. He says, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. That's not an answer that any of us really like to hear. Because all of us want to be in control of our lives. We want to be in control of what's going on around us. And what they have to realize is that they don't control what's going to happen next. This is all going to happen because God wants it to happen and in the way God wants it to happen. And here are the apostles, the most, the most beloved members of the family of Jesus' immediate family, th those men that have attached themselves to him, and yet he's telling them, I'm not going to answer your question. You, you have an inquisitive child in your family who asks questions, and they ask questions sometimes that you say, mm, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> Does that ever work? Because if it works in your home, I'd like to know what you do, because I can never stop the follow-up question, question, question. Because we want to know. But he says, no, I'm not going to tell you. And then as you continue forward, I want to skip down to verse 11. And then it says, okay, so verse, they're standing there and, and they see something wondrous happen. I almost think about Elisha when he saw Elijah go up to heaven in that whirlwind. All right? They're standing there and all of a sudden Jesus just begins to ascend to heaven. 
What a moment that must have been like. It's almost the reverse of what happened at the baptism of Jesus with John the Immerser when the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. Now this time Jesus is ascending back to heaven. And they're standing there and they're watching this. And it's just a moment of awe and, 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 and just wonder as he's just floating away. And I wonder how long they stood there before the angels said, um, why are you standing here? And, and they say, they go on to say, and it shall come to pass, oh, sorry, verse 20. Um, no, I'm skipping ahead. Verse 11, sorry. This Jesus who, you, uh, who was taken up from you into heaven will come again or come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now here are a group of men, 11 at this point. There'll be 12. The number 12 will be restored shortly. But there are 11 men here who have invested so much of themselves into this ministry and into this work. And now their master, their Lord, has been taken away from them again. And this time, he's not going to just come right back in three days. And there's so much they don't understand. There's so much about the world. There's so much about the plan of God. There's so much about the mystery of God. They don't know. And so they're left to wonder as they gaze up what will happen tomorrow. What will happen tomorrow? Sometimes we're left asking those kind of questions. What about tomorrow? What about the time we've been given? In this kind of frame of mind, I want to ask a question. Are we living in the end of time? Are we living in the end of time or the end times? Um, you know, there's a lot of different opinion about the end of time and there's a lot of false teaching out there about the, the way time's going to end and on the judgment day. And a lot of people ask the question, because it's something like the apostles we desire to look into, and God has given us a limited amount of information. Are we living in the end times? Well, I don't want to answer this. I, I want the Word of God to answer. So I want to go in Acts, just go one chapter over. Peter is preaching what is recorded as the very first gospel sermon. The first message of grace and mercy to be delivered about the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. And, and he mentions some things in this text I, I just want us to note. Now he's quoting from Joel, Joel chapter 2, if you want to go back and read the prophet's original writing. But he, he's going to use that text to apply to, uh, to the day of Pentecost and, and to the message he is preaching and he says, but this was what was uttered by the prophet Joel. Verse 17, you notice right away, well, how does he title this? And in the last days it shall pass. In the last times, at the end of the age. God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And he goes on to talk about more. Verse 18 again, he says, I will pour out my spirit. Uh, verse 19, I will show wonders in the heavens. Um, and, and he talks about those wonders. And I want you to go down to uh, verse 21. And it shall come to pass when in the last days, this is the Joel the prophet Joel looking ahead to what Peter's saying to right now. Peter's saying right today, this scripture is being fulfilled. In the last days, 
It shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Peter says, in Acts chapter 2, we are living in the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, the last days. You go to Hebrews chapter 1. I want you to notice again what the text says about the ministry or the, um, uh, of Jesus and, and what He did. He says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, Long ago, uh, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But, but in these what? In these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed to be heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. Are we living in the last days? Yes. We are living in the final days of this world. We are in that period. We're at the end of the age. There's not going to be another uh, messenger sent from God to bring us a new covenant. We're living in the covenant of Christ, in the last covenant of God. So, the next question, logically speaking, is we're living in the last days. That's the period we live in. Is it possible to know when Jesus is coming back? Can we know the date of his return? Is it going to be in my lifetime? Is it going to be at a such and such a date? And a lot of people over the years have tried to establish dates. I'm always amazed that always gets revised. <laughs> always did my math wrong. I got a little number wrong here or there, but here's the new one. Can we know when Jesus is coming back? Well, again, don't care what I have to say. My opinion on the matter doesn't really matter. What does the Word of God have to say about it? I want you to notice something. Uh, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus, in His ministry, actually spoke a lot about His second coming, about Judgment Day, about the end of time. And so we just need Him to speak to us. Now, I was talking to somebody, a brother in Christ, who, 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 who agrees we're living in the end times, and he really believes that we're living at the end of the end of times. <laughs> like, like all the things going on and everything. Well, I'm going to ask the question, can we know that? We might opinionize on it. We look around and we've heard people, maybe we ourselves have said, oh, this has got to be it. I mean, God's going to definitely, I mean, things just can't get any worse. Well, is that true? It really doesn't matter what you and I have to say. What does God say? Let's go to Matthew 13. Jesus gives us a parable here. We've entitled it the, 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 the parable of the weeds or the weeds among the wheat. Matthew 13. I'm going to summarize some of this for us. But in, starting in verse 24, he lays out a parable saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. And so he goes on to tell us about this, um, this man who, who sowed a field full of good seed. Now, he emphasized the word good because it's going to be compared about what's going to come into the field afterwards. So he sows this field of wheat, and it's good seed. But what happens? Well, along comes someone who begins to sow tares or weeds in amongst the wheat. And so the servant, verse 27, comes to the master and he asks a question. He says, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said, verse 28, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you uproot the wheat along with them. Verse 30, Let us... Uh, sorry, let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. 
but gather the wheat into my barn. So you're an apostle. You're sitting there hearing Jesus say this, and you may ask the question, Jesus, what does this have to do with anything? What are you talking about? Well, he doesn't leave us to wonder. If you go down that same text, he explains exactly what he means. Verse 36. After the crowds left, the disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. Verse 37. He, said, he answered uh, them and he said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. So obviously, what's the context? He's talking about his ministry. He's talking about the church. The field is the world, and the good seeds are the, is the sons of the kingdom. That's you and me. We're the children of God, right? That's all the members of Christ's kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end, what? The harvest is the end of the age. It's at the end of the end times. The end. <laughs> like you watch a movie and it comes to that last line, right? Well, they say, the end. After this, there's no more. Now, I know some movies start to throw on extra scenes at the end, right? We... We wait around through all the credits to see what funny scene they may put up. But when Jesus says, this is the end, this is the end. Now, I want you to notice something about this. At that time, verse 41, he, uh, he, will, he will send out his reapers, the angels, to gather uh, all, that causes, uh, all the causes of sin and all lawbreakers. He'll throw them into the fiery furnace. And there they'll be punished. The righteous, however, verse 43, will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. What's interesting to note here is he's implying that this sowing of good seed and evil seed will continue until the end of the age. Now, I know there's some, some doctrines out there that teach that that uh, at the end there's going to be this period of seven years and a thousand years and, and all this doctrine. That's not what the Bible teaches. It says at the end, when, when, when God says this is the end, that's the end. There's no additional thousand and seven years afterwards. At the end, he'll send out his reapers. Um, In Matthew 24, he gives us some further explanation of this. And I want you to notice something. Verse 23, uh, verse, I'm sorry, Matthew 24, verse 3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be? What are they asking again? You know, they're asking for, for him to explain when all of God's, uh, all these things are going to happen. And so um, they ask, and what will the sign of your coming and of the end of the age be? Now I want you to note there, they ask two questions. It's important you note that. They ask two questions. What, what, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So really, they're asking three questions, aren't they? Well, he goes on to explain that. He answers the first question. And then in verse 36, he'll answer their second question. Notice he says, but concerning that day, his second coming, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Again, they're going to be left without any information. And I think it's interesting that he says this for a certain reason. Notice as he goes on. No one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son. He admits to them, I don't even know this. Only the Father in heaven. Jesus not only didn't answer it, 
He couldn't answer it. He says, I don't know. Now, if Jesus doesn't know, how in the world can you and I know? You continue reading in verse 37. He says, For as the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So he, he gives them an illustration. Now, remember Matthew 13. He said that, that, that the things that of the earth that, that have been going on where you have good men and evil men will continue on. Well, notice what he says. He says, But as were the days of Noah, so will the Son of Man, so will the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, life continuing on as it always has, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And then what did it do? It began to rain. And they, will, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will the coming of, son, of the Son of Man. What's he saying to us? I'm not giving you any signs. I'm not giving you anything to even look for. There's not going to be a particular sign that says, this is it, God's ready, time's up, I'm sending the sign. He says, no, that's not the way it's going to be. Peter has a little bit to say about this too. If you go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, uh, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your mind by, by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. All right, so he's saying he's trying to encourage them, exhort them to continue in their faith. Knowing this first, verse 3, what? Knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. He's emphasizing what they're doing, isn't he? Scoffers who scoff. That's like saying golfers who golf. Right, that's what they do. Scoffers will come scoffing doing what? What are they scoffing about? I'm going to see how many times I can say that word in one sermon. What are they, going to, what are they saying? What are they questioning? Well, he says, verse 4, they will say, where is the promise of His coming. For ever since the fathers fell asleep, things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. He says the world's just turning. What were the apostles asking for? What are the, what's the sign? Jesus says there's no sign. I'm not giving you a sign. Peter says there are going to be those who ask for a sign in the last days. There's no sign there. And they're going to scoff and say, see, Jesus isn't coming back. Now, all this faith stuff you talk about, life just continues as it is. We're just all uh, creatures of, of, of chance and uh, we're all just uh, blobs floating around in space with, with no meaning in our life and when we die, you just die and that's it. Scoffers who scoff. And then he goes on. I don't know if I have this on there, but... Verse 10. We'll begin at verse 8. I got verse 10 up here, but let's back up to verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact. There are going to be those who, 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 who come and they question God, they question the promise of His coming. But don't overlook this one fact. That with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. God doesn't count time the way we do. God is not slow to fulfill His promise. What's His promise of the coming of Christ? He's not slow. He's not being slow as some count slowness. But He's patient toward us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. I think about Moses, um, Abraham and Sodom and Abraham trying to negotiate with God. Man, if there's, 
and God telling him he's going to destroy Sodom. And what does Abraham say? Well, 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 wait, God, wait, God. Now, what if there's 50 in Sodom that, 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 that are not evil? Will you save them for that? And God says, yes. Well, well, what about if there's 40? What if there's 30? What about if there's 20? What about if there's 10? God says, each time, okay. If there's that many, we'll count them, I'll count them. And if there's that many, I'll stop. The sad thing is, he, there weren't even 10 in Sodom who had not given themselves over to evil. Why does God wait? Why is Jesus, why is it taking him 2,000 years? Because God is, is desirous, God is patient with us, wanting us all to come to repentance. God's looking for that last soul. He's like that shepherd with the one who, sheep that goes lost, and he goes and he looks for it. He's looking for those few. However, verse 10, but, but, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Now this, this illustration of a thief is used several times. Paul and both Peter use it, and Jesus will even use it. Paul, in his writing to the Thessalonians, uses this illustration in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, The day of the Lord, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 2, The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You know, when a thief comes to our home, he doesn't call ahead to make sure you're home. He doesn't say, hey, uh, I just want to let you know I'm planning on breaking in, you know, Wednesday evening. Now, I'm going to give you a chance to get out of the house, or, you know, so I can get in and do my work and get back out. That's not the way a thief works, is it? He goes on to describe it this way. He says, then suddenly, verse 3, Destruction will come. Then suddenly, Jesus will return. Can we know when He's going to return? No. He didn't even know. How can we expect to know? And then lastly, and most importantly, since we know we're living in the last days, there's not going to be another Savior. There's not going to be another way out. There's not going to be another source of grace and mercy. Jesus is it. We're living in the last days. And none of us know when it's going to end. We don't know when it's going to end for us personally. And we don't know when it's going to end permanently for this world. But we know it's coming, and it will come suddenly. So therefore, what we have to ask, are we prepared for that day? Peter, back in 2 Peter chapter 3, he goes on to point this out. After saying in verse 10 that he'll come like a thief in the night, he says, based on that, since all these things are to be thus dissolved, what sort of person ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? He goes on in verse 14 to say, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, waiting for the second coming of Christ, be diligent to be found in Him without spot or blemish and at peace. At peace with whom? At peace with God. At peace with your faith, at peace with your end. It's incumbent. It is, it is the most important question we will ever ask. Are you ready? Are you ready for that great day? For that great and terrifying day of the Lord Paul, again in 2 Thessalonians this time, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, he warns them and also encourages Christians by saying that uh, when Christ returns, he says in verse 6, to repay affliction upon those who afflict you. When He comes, 
not as Savior, but as judge to inflict affliction upon those who afflict you. Verse, uh, end of verse 7. When Jesus, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting or taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who have not obeyed the gospel of our Lord Jesus. We get one shot at this. We get it one shot, one opportunity in this life. This is our opportunity. This is our uh, test, testing ground. This is our opportunity to taste the grace and mercy of Jesus. Make the most of it. Because when Jesus comes back, He will not come as Savior. He will come as Judge. And He will execute the justice of God on those who do not know God. And those who have not obeyed the gospel, that is a severe warning to us to be prepared and for us to help others get prepared. He begins verse 9 by saying, They, those who do not know God, those who have not obeyed the gospel, will suffer punishment. Will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Is it important for us to be prepared, absolutely. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus again lays out the scenario of judgment. He says in verse 31, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will, uh, will be gathered all the nations and He will separate people one from another as as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. He will place the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That will be a great, amazing day for those who are prepared. We will put aside the shackles of this life we will put aside pain and suffering with worry and anxiety. All of those things will be torn away from us. And we will live with the eternal peace that only God can deliver. What a great day that will be for those who are prepared. However, for those who are not prepared, to those on his left, verse 41 tells us, he will say to them, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46 says, and these, those on the left, will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It's so vitally important that you and I are prepared to meet God. I can't think about how terrifying that day must be for those who are not prepared. I don't want to be among that number. Hebrews 10, 31 just, just echoes in my brain. It is a terrifying thing to the fall into the hands of the living God. I don't want to face that day unprepared. Amos says in his prophetic writing to the Israelites, and I think it applies to us. He says, Therefore, thus I will do, speaking from the perspective of God, I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God. O Israel, prepare to meet your God. Some of us are not prepared for that day. I hope this terrifies you. I hope it does. It should. I hope it gives hope to those of us who have prepared ourselves. I hope it gives you hope that one day you will be able to lay aside all the pain, all the bad things of this life, and you'll never have to experience those again. What an awesome feeling that is. 
But for those of you who continue to refuse, at least be honest enough with yourself to understand what you're choosing. Prepare to meet thy God. May I encourage you to get rid of that terror. There's no need to live that way. God has provided you a way of escape. If you will simply obey, if you'll simply share in the blood, in the sacrifice of Jesus, your sins can be washed away. And so it comes down to a question to all of us. Are we prepared to meet our God? Tonight, this afternoon at 5, we're going to go into a second part of this lesson, talk about Judgment Day itself and what that will look like. But as we think about this message, I preach this first because I think it's, and to the most people, because I think it's the most important. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. If you're not, why would you continue to live any longer in that state of worry, anxiety, that state of fear? Let fear go. There is no love. In, uh, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. In the love of Christ, I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be worried. I can know I'm saved. As Van comes forward to lead us in this song, go ahead and turn in your song books. You can come on up, Van. Think about your condition, your spiritual condition. Are you ready? Are you ready for that great day? If not... Why don't you make a change this very day as we can as we stand and as we sing? When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good. If you'll turn over to uh, 954 with me. 954.
If you would, turn me over to number 272. 272. 272. As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me.
Brother Steve's going to dismiss us in prayer. Um, good morning. Have a seat, please. Make yourself comfortable. I just got a few things to say. Um, if we have any visitors, if you haven't already turned in your uh, visitor's card, uh, there are still some more in the back. Please feel free to take time and fill those out and make sure we get them. It's not so we can have a mailing list that we can sell to somebody. We just want to make sure to uh, to greet you and make sure that we can uh, visit with you later if, uh, if the opportunity avails us. Um, reminder, evening devotional today, Lads to Leaders, starts at 5 o'clock. Um, Wednesday at 7 p.m., we'll have Bible uh, class again. And Thursday at 10.30 a.m., we have uh, um, uh, another adult Bible study. Uh, so plenty of opportunity to come here and to, to study God's Word more throughout the week. So please take that opportunity. And if there are no other announcements, then uh, please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the rain that you've given us today to water our plants and to support us and sustain us in our in our life needs, Father, we we ask that uh, that 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 you give us the appreciation for the weather and for the changes in the weather and and to understand that that's for our own good, Father. We thank you for the opportunity that we had to come together and to worship your name and to uh, and to encourage each other and to and to build each other up, Father. I ask that this sustains us as we go through our lives until we next come together. Be with those who can't be with us, Father, due to travel or health, whether that be physical or spiritual, Father, and help us to minister to those who need uh, need help to get better and, and be with those who are ministering to those who need help, Father, and to guide guide their hands and bring them back to health. Father, we ask that you be with those who are not here today um, um, because of the health. Uh, and, Father, we ask that you uh, care for those uh, um, who, who are in need of your health, Father. Father, we ask that you be with the leaders and the service members in our country. Help them to, to protect us, Father, and to protect the rights that we have. And, and Father, help them to, to, to do it in a way that, that meets your will and is pleasing to you, Father. And Father, help us to support them in ways that we can and to challenge them when it needs to be challenged, Father, and, and, and protect us, Father, when that happens. Father, forgive us of our short thought comings. Father, I ask that you uh, be with us and help us be forgiving of those, especially, Father, and understand that without us forgiving others, we can't be forgiven of our sins. Bless us, Father. Shower us with your love and be with us and bring us back together again. We pray in your Son's holy name. Amen.